The Stall Goldfield is way out on its own in more ways than one. It's at the western margin of the whole Victorian Gold Province and the geology here is much more complex compared to Bendigo or Ballarat. In the 19th century, miners worked the quartz loads down to an amazing 800 metres. But in 1920, the static price of gold could no longer support costly exploration, forcing the mine to close. It wasn't until the price of gold rose in the 1980s that Stahl's unique geological flavour enticed a new generation of explorers. And since then, that research has paid off. The Magdala deposit has become Victoria's most successful mine, producing over two million ounces of gold. And with a decline tunnel that spirals down to 1600 metres, it's one of the deepest mines in Australia. Exploration geologist Dr Anthony Morey describes one of the historic quartz loads. This vein we are looking at now is quite a good example of what is called the central load here at the Store Gold Mine. The central load is interesting because the old time miners chased this vein from the surface even deeper than where we are now. We are at currently 200 metres below the surface. The old miners had a lot of success, but never fully understood the complex geology. After the mine reopened in 1982, there were some tricky questions to be answered. Did a large dome of basalt, now just below the surface, control the formation and distribution of quartz loads? And was there any prospect of finding gold beneath a major fault called the South Fault since no past mining had ever ventured this deep. That's when the University of Melbourne became involved. Led by Professor Chris Wilson, a research team finally helped to unravel this complex deposit. Stool, in fact, is probably the biggest structural challenge anywhere in Victoria in terms of trying to work out the three-dimensional geometry. All told, we can recognise somewhere in the order of seven deformation events in Stahl. And these events had an important effect along the margin of the hard basalt. Where we've got rocks of different strengths beside one another, for instance, at Stahl, where we've got strong basalts up against weak sandstones and shales, we talk about a competency contrast. And the deformation is actually localised on the boundary between the stronger, more competent basalts and the weaker sandstones and shales. The deformation is localised in fault zones and these become the pathways for the fluid flow. And this is where the sites of mineralisation are usually focused. So most quartz veins, like the central load, formed close to the margin of the basalt. The central load is hosted tens of metres, 20 to 30 metres sometimes, uh, laterally away from the actual margin of the basalt dome. So here we're wholly, uh, this vein is wholly hosted within sedimentary rocks. The research team had now identified that the faulted contact between the basalt and the sedimentary rocks had been a major conduit for gold-bearing fluids 440 million years ago. Over the past 160 years, Mining has traced this extraordinary structure down to nearly a kilometre from the surface. We stopped to see another beautiful example of the central load at the 950 metre level. Here the texture of the quartz reveals how the vein grew over time. What we have here is actually quite a spectacular exposure of the central load. One of the important things of the central load is that uh, it is a classic laminated quartz vein which is typical of many orogenic gold deposits around the world. I asked Chris Wilson to explain how this type of laminated quartz forms. This is from the central load system at Stahl. Is that what we can see here is we've got a pure quartz vein through here. We've got a darker rich seam through here which has got quartz and this dark mineral and most of that dark mineral is the carbon-rich shales, which have been left over from when the fluids come in, inject into the, the wall rocks. So, th so these dark fragments, 
they're actually detached pieces of the wall rock? They're fragments of the wall rock which are caught up in the fluids and in the fault zone. They're irregular, they're not planar. And these are what are commonly referred to as stylites. Like growth rings in a tree, the stylolites beautifully highlight how the vein grew. It grew layer by layer parallel to the fault. With each fault movement, pressurised fluids surged in to precipitate a new layer of white quartz. At the same time, dark lines of wall rock detached from the wall of the fault then were frozen within the ever-widening quartz load. But the wall rock lines, or stylolites, have another significance. They had the right chemistry to promote gold deposition. These fragments of wall rock are actually interacting with the, the quartz and the fluids through here, and it's the interaction between the fluid and the, the graphite that actually produces where the gold mineralization occurs. Graphite helps gold to precipitate so it's very common to find that gold grains have formed along the stylolites. Geologists are always glad to see stylolites in quartz. Certainly, if you start to see a vein with a lot of frag wall rock fragments, then you know that there's a good chance that you're going to have high-grade gold values. Back at the mine, Anthony Morey took me to see a huge library of drill cores. We went there to see some of the minerals that formed along the basalt contact. So what have we got here, Anthony? Here we have a representative drill hole showing the basalt contact load. That is where, right on the margin of the basalt, we have sedimentary rocks that host the gold mineralisation. Is this typical of what you see along that contact zone here? Yes, this and these sedimentary rocks are very strongly chloride altered and the dark material you can see here is mainly chloride. And you also have quite complexly deformed quartz carbonate veins and in this example too uh, some pyrotite. What's the derivation of that? Yeah, it looks as though it's quite, again, a multi-stage history. It, uh, the sedimentary rocks most likely had biogenic uh, pyrite associated with them and through regional metamorphism, um, this, this framboidal pyrite grew to quite coarse grain crystals, as we can see in this example, and then through further regional metamorphism and hydrothermal alteration, that pyrite alters to pyrotite. By the early 1990s, geological research had identified the faulted margin of the basalt as a prime control of mineralization. But as the ore reserves in the mine started to run out, they needed to tackle the most difficult question. Was there gold beneath the south fault? And if so, where? Senior exploration geologist Sarah Hurd showed me the problem fault. This is the south fault here. You can see it appears to dip to the north and it's also dipping towards us to the east. The problem was the company had no idea where the gold mineralisation was located below the fault or even if it existed. Well, they did put some drill holes in and didn't have much luck um, not intersecting these contact loads. So went back to 3D modelling. Um, and also getting some help from the University of Melbourne um, to look at the actual structure and try and determine what the sense of movement was and um, the potential offset. The university's Dr John Miller and Professor Chris Wilson spent months underground mapping the fault structures in the smallest detail. Their aim was to understand how the South Fault had displaced the gold deposit. We could make a prediction of what the direction was and that was done by the orientation of the fault and looking at the slicken side striations on the fault plane and the extensional veins and from the three-dimensional geometry of the folds and the rock types we estimated that there would be an offset of about 600 meters and then the company put down a drill hole of about two kilometers in depth intersected a new zone of mineralization which is known as the Golden Gift mineralization. The discovery of the Golden Gift 
gave the mine new life. The South Fault had hidden it from miners for 150 years. The geological model was now working. The fault had displaced the mineralisation down to the north. And in cross-section, we can see that the Golden Gift was also displaced to the east. At depth, other faults further broke up the gift into small segments. So it's quite complicated. Yes, <laughs> which makes it even more amazing that they were discovered. The discovery of the Golden Gift was a great piece of work by the geological team. The application of structural geology extended the life of Victoria's deepest working mine.